Well, thanks. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, so I am uh, TV's Jim Parsons. Uh, despite what Dealey said, in my, in my off time when I'm not on television, uh, I like to research Art Deco in Texas because I'm a well-rounded individual. So if I look different, it's just because the camera, um, you know, does that to you. So uh, no, but, but seriously, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not that one, even though we are both from Houston and, you know, that's apparently funny to some people. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I do work for Preservation Houston, like Dealey said. Um, the reason that I'm here talking about Fair Park is because of, of the book uh, Fair Park Deco and then the, the other book uh, DFW Deco. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard me and my co-author David speak about either of those, but um, if you have, you'll hear some of the same things tonight, but, but there's a lot more to it. Um, we, we started looking at Art Deco in Texas just because it was a field that had not been uh, there hadn't been much written about it, and, and we were going to do this book about Dallas and Fort Worth and all the wonderful Art Deco in North Texas, and then we got sidetracked at Fair Park and realized what a wonderful place it was, and so that led us down this great rabbit hole, and, and that's, that's how I came to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, DHS for having me here tonight. Dealey has been a great help in unearthing some of the things that you'll see. Um, there are also a lot of other archives that, that this material comes from. Um, the DHS archive is, is the main one, but also the, the archive at the State Fair, the Dallas Public Library, um, the Dallas Municipal Archive. You guys are really lucky, I don't know if you know it, to have as many wonderful archives and repositories as you do, which is not the kind of thing that people get excited about except for like us. But trust me, there are people who are looking out for your history and you are really lucky to have that. Um, I want to say at the outset uh, just a couple of things about, about what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is not going to be comprehensive. Um, it can't be because I don't think you want to stay here all night. I know I want to eat at some point. Um, there is just so much to talk about anytime you, you discuss Fair Park. It's such a, such a rich uh, place with so much history and so many stories. But what I want to do is, is to tell you about some of the things that have been lost at, at Fair Park, some of the things that have been partially lost, some of the things that have been recreated, just to give you a sense of how the park that you see today is different from what you would have experienced 80 years ago. Um, we are gonna focus on uh, the structures and the art that date from 1936, from the Texas Centennial, and that is because the 1936 Centennial reconstruction of Fair Park resulted in the Fair Park that we have today. There were previous versions of Fair Park, but there's almost nothing left that shows you what those would have looked like, so we're, we're not gonna cover that. Um, I am going to try to dispel some, some myths and rumors uh, about some of these things. Um, I can certainly understand why there are myths and rumors about Fair Park, but I need to tell you from the outset, I don't know all the local lore. I don't know all the backstory. I grew up in Houston. We just do our best to pretend Dallas isn't there. So um, I, I, I hope that, <laughs> I hope, uh, that's right, it's not working. Here I am. Um, but I hope that uh, if there is a good story that, that you think I ought to know, uh, we can talk about it one-on-one, -on -one or, or if it's one you want to share with everybody, you can raise your hand and let us all know. So, all that out of the way, uh, let's actually start talking about Lost Fair Park. Um, I wanted to start with a quick overview of Fair Park itself, just to kind of set the stage for, for how we got to where we are. Uh, the park got its start back in 1886. Uh, it was 80 acres on the prairie east of Dallas. Uh, it was bought to host what was then called the Dallas State Fair and Exposition, which has morphed into the Texas State Fair. Uh, the land was not great. Um, it wasn't ne necessarily near anything, and they called it the worst kind of hog wallow because anytime it rained, it would turn into a swamp. So there's that. Um, this engraving that you see shows the fairgrounds in 1890. Um, there are also a couple of views here um, of, of other things on early Fair Park. Uh, the main gate at Perry Avenue on the left, which looks a little bit better today. Um, on the right is the Exposition Building, which was one of the biggest things in Dallas uh, when it was built in 1887. Um, but as you can see, it was a very different place back then. Uh, over the years, um, the, the State Fair grew and it, it took Fair Park along with it. Uh, there were some more impressive buildings that were built. Uh, there were more acres added to the park. I wish we could see some of this, um, but these buildings are either gone or uh, in the case of the Coliseum down here, or actually these two bottom buildings were totally remodeled in 1935 and 36. So you can't see uh, what they used to look like. Um, the biggest change to Fair Park happened when uh, Dallas won its bid to host the Texas Centennial Exposition uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Texas independence from Mexico. Architect George Dahl, who is here looking suspicious on the right, 
Um, I always wondered why, I, he looks like he's just annoyed that someone's taking his picture, but um, George Dahl and his team of architects and engineers uh, overhauled nearly every inch of Fair Park. They uh, started in the summer of 1935, finished by June the 6th, 1936, when the exposition opened, and they turned the old Fair Park, the old hog wallow, into a new modernistic uh, exposition grounds. Um, they remodeled and enlarged a dozen existing Fair Park buildings. They built more than 50 new ones from the ground up. They installed new landscaping, utility lines, streets, and sidewalks. Um, they did it all in about nine months, which is pretty amazing. But they didn't have safety back then, so it was a lot easier to, to build things. Um, Dahl and his designers either designed or had the final approval over every aspect of the park. One newspaper reporter said that Dahl was responsible for everything from the smallest peanut stand up to the biggest exhibit hall, and, and that was true. Um, what's amazing, um, as, as I said, is that this entire project, it was uh, 200 acres, $25 million, and done in less than a year, which the more you think about it, the more amazing that gets. Part of the reason that they were able to do that is they pioneered um, a, a, a short construction schedule. So actually, sometimes they were still designing a building while they were laying the foundation. They would basically pour the foundation and then go, well, we'll figure it out. Um, but but it was, it was a, a construction project like Texas had never seen before. Um, the Centennial Exposition, the result of all this, uh, had a successful six-month run in the uh, summer and fall of 1936. Then the next year, 1937, Fair Park hosted the second year of the exposition. It, it didn't make any sense to do Centennial again because there's only one Centennial. So they called the second year the Greater Texas and Pan American Exposition. Um, it was supposed to be a celebration of our good neighbor policy with Latin America, so it was, a, a, it was Texas reaching out to Latin American nations. Um, the idea was that they had already spent all this money on Fair Park, so why not use it again for another exposition? Uh, it didn't work out to be super successful. Uh, the Pan American Expo ran for four months. Uh, about four people came. Um, <laughs> One observer said that the name, the Greater Texas and Pan American Exposition, was larger than the attendance of the fair, which was only partly mean because really it was, it was kind of sad. Um, it's important to remember when we talk about Fair Park today that 40% of the buildings that were built in 1936 were intended to be demolished. And, and I think that's something that gets lost in the story. Uh, we talk about all these, these buildings that are gone, but they knew that a lot of them were gonna be gone. That, that was the plan. Uh, some of them look really substantial and some of them look like things that should have lasted for years, but, but no. Uh, the remaining 60% of structures were intended for use by the state fair going forward. So they were either classified as permanent buildings or as semi-permanent buildings. Um, a permanent building is like the one that we're in, the Hall of State, which is still here. Um, a semi-permanent building was supposed to have a lifespan of 10 years to 15 years. Uh, so the idea was the State Fair would use it for a while and then they would replace it eventually. Um, you may be surprised to learn some of those semi-permanent buildings we have really gotten a lot of mileage out of, like the Federal Building, which is now called the Tower Building. Um, that was supposed to be replaced in 10 or 15 years. I think George Dahl would be really surprised to find that we're still using it today. Um, but you, you may be aware, and we'll talk more later about some of the work that's gone into restoring some of the Fair Park buildings. Part of that is because they were never supposed to still be with us 80 years later. Um, some of the uh, temporary buildings were demolished soon after the 1936 exposition closed. Uh, there were some temporary concession buildings that came down, also some more substantial buildings like the National Cash Register building on the left. Um, I don't know why they called it that, it, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the uh, Hall of Negro Life on the right. We're gonna talk about both of those a little bit more later on. Um, after the Pan American Expo closed in 1937, most of the remaining temporary buildings were, were demolished. They did use some of them for the second season, but, but not all of them. Um, so the buildings that were demolished in 37 included uh, the Ford Motor Company building, which we're also gonna talk more about later, but that's one that I really wish were still around. Um, over the years, uh, other buildings were lost, either totally or partially. Uh, there were also other things that were lost, landscape features, light standards, drinking fountains, benches, murals, statues, uh, a lot of other things that contributed to the overall look of Fair Park. So even though Fair Park is still, still here and is still what it is and still is, is a place where you can go to get a sense of what it was like to attend the Centennial Exposition, it's not complete. Um, and I'm not saying that in, in any derogatory way, but you know, it, it's, it's great that we have what we have but as you're walking around Fair Park, you're not seeing the entire picture because there are things that, that just were never meant to last. Um, 
I have to mention here, by the way, Fair Park is the only place in the world you can go to get a sense of, of what it was like to attend one of these fairs. It's the only place that has an, an even 60% intact 1930s fairground. It is a fantastic asset, and it's something that almost every city in the world would kill to have, and you guys have it in your backyard, so that's pretty cool. Um, if it were in Houston, we would have torn it down a long time ago. Um, with all of that out of the way, I wanted to talk about some of the parts of Fair Park that are, that are not with us anymore. Uh, and I figured, you know, why not start big with the Ford Building, which I showed you a second ago. Um, it was one of the most prominent buildings at the Centennial Exposition. Uh, it was located next to the uh, Tower Building, the former Federal Building. So if you left the Hall of State and turned left, uh, you would have seen it down at the, at the end of the plaza. Uh, it was the largest privately funded exhibit hall at Fair Park. It had a 55,000 square foot footprint uh, and a main exhibit room that was 337 feet long. So the main space was longer than a football field. Uh, the architect was Albert Kahn of Detroit, a really famous uh, architect. Um, I mentioned earlier that George Dahl's team oversaw the design of, of everything at Fair Park, but private exhibitors like Ford could bring in their own architects if they wanted to. George Dahl still had to sign off on this, but, but it didn't mean that he had to design it himself. Um, Walter Dorwin Teague is the other name who's associated with the Ford Building. He was the leading industrial designer in the country at the time, and he actually took a lot of credit for the design of the building. I don't know how much of it was Kahn and how much of it was Teague. I do know Teague did all of the uh, exhibits on the inside of the building, so I suspect he shaped a lot of the interior spaces as well. Uh, Teague was a, a relentless self-promoter, so he was happy to say that he had a lot to do with this building. Um, you may not know Teague's name, and I'm just curious, is anybody familiar with, with Teague? Is this somebody anybody's ever heard of? Well, you will know some of the things that he did. Um, he designed the iconic Brownie camera on the left, uh, and he also designed the service stations that Texaco built from 1936 uh, to 1964. Um, there's still a handful of those around that look like that, but most of them were remodeled, but some of you will remember uh, getting gas at a station that looked like this. Um, the exhibits in the Ford building showed how, it's really, my heart races every time I say this, how Texas agricultural products were made into the parts of Ford automobiles. I know, isn't that exciting? Um, you could, but it actually was cooler than it sounds. Uh, you could watch uh, soybeans being turned into plastic. Um, they had women who were weaving cotton into upholstery and then they had these giant machines that would sew it into a car seat. Uh, they talked about you know, how leather was made into different car parts. And, um, so the, the idea was you were supposed to go in and you were supposed to leave with the impression that, hey, Texas produces a lot of things that make my new V8. Um, some people will tell you, this, this is one of those misconceptions, um, some people will tell you that they actually made Fords in this building, that, that the idea was you could walk through the exhibit and you could see a Ford like go from parts to finished automobile. That wasn't true. Um, they, they did make certain things, like they made upholstery just as a demonstration, and there was a team of guys whose job it was to assemble and then disassemble and then reassemble a V8 engine just over and over and over. Um, but they didn't make a car. Uh, Ford did encourage fairgoers to visit its uh, assembly plant on Grand Avenue, not too far from here. So the idea was you'd come see this and then you'd go over and tour the Ford plant. And I think that's why people think that there was an assembly line in here. But anyway, uh, if anybody ever tells you that, you can smack them. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of pictures of specific areas inside the Ford building just to, to, to show you the high level of design here and to stress this is a building that was meant to be torn down. I mean, it was a substantial building, but they never intended it to last. They always knew it was going to go away. Um, the picture on the left is, is part of the entrance to the exhibits. Um, that was what Walter Dorwin Teague called the fountain of Texas products. It wasn't actually a fountain, but it looked like cascades of like cotton and mohair and different things. Uh, on the right is uh, the executive lounge, and that was where they would entertain visiting Ford dignitaries. But you know, when you look at this, this doesn't look like what you would think of, of a temporary building looking like. I think of like a temporary school building or that looks like a mobile home. I don't think of a swanky Art Deco space. Um, but, you know, this, this came down after 1937. Uh, so Ford did have a successful run at the Centennial Exposition. It was one of the more popular buildings, but the company did not return for the Pan American Exposition. Uh, Ford generally had a habit of not doing two years at an exposition. They would do one, they would do a big blowout and then they would leave. Um, so for the Pan Am, uh, they leased their building to the exposition as a general exhibit building. It was renamed the Pan American Palace. 
And George Dahl had some pretty exciting designs for it, which you might have seen uh, out in the lobby here. Um, he put out these renderings and drawings that showed um, kitschy Mesoamerican stuff stuck all over the building. Uh, there was also what I remembered as a volcano. It actually is a volcano in one of the paintings out there, but here it's like a, a place where they would sacrifice people on the roof um, or something. Uh, unfortunately, that, that was just a concept. Um, this, this wasn't actually done. What you saw in 1937 was they took a lot of the existing buildings and like changed the lighting and changed the signage and uh, planted some palm trees and changed the names of everything. Like um, the, the Texas Court of Honor became the Patio de Honor. Um, the Midway became La Rambla. The Esplanade became El Esplanade. Um, <laughs> But, you know, they, they didn't go all out like they wanted you to think that they were doing. Anyway, um, after the Pan American Exposition closed, uh, the Ford Building was demolished pretty quickly. Um, by the time the State Fair opened again in 1938, the site was being used to display uh, farm machinery in motion, which is even more exciting than agricultural products being made into Ford parts. Uh, today, um, part of the site of the Ford Building is occupied by Grand Place, uh, which is, is still there. Um, it, all I can say about it is it's, it's on the side of the Ford building. It's not nearly as exciting as the Ford building was, but there has been talk about recreating this building, and I'm not sure how far that's actually gotten, but I'd, I'd be in favor of that, um, whatever that's worth. Uh, just southeast of the Ford building was another structure that uh, Walter Dorwin Teague had a hand in. Remember, Teague had designed the Texaco uh, service station prototype, and he also designed the Texaco pavilion for the Centennial Exposition. Um, so this building just housed exhibits for Texaco, and the oil companies did, like, they were really big on dioramas, so they would do dioramas of oil fields, they would do exhibits about, you know, the many uses of petroleum products, all that kind of thing. Um, the Texaco building was sited at the end of the Midway, so it had a pretty prominent uh, location, and it held its site with this tower, um, which was covered in neon and had a big version of the Texaco Star logo, which Walter Dorvin Teague had also just redesigned. So this was a big Teague showcase. Um, Texaco uh, continued to use this building after the exposition closed. They uh, were a, a recurring exhibitor at the State Fair. Uh, they were here through at least the 1940s. After that, uh, the building was leased to various concessions uh, through at least the 50s and uh, it was demolished either in the later 50s or in the early 60s. Uh, you don't see it show up in pictures by the mid 60s, so it had gone away by then, but it did hang on for a while. Um, now, not too far from Texaco was one more Teague Design building, which is the one I really wish were still here. Um, it was the National Cash Register Pavilion. Uh, now, Teague had also designed the actual cash register for National Cash Register. So what he's doing here is just taking his cash register design and blowing it up to, to giant proportions. Um, the cash register that you see here was 40 feet tall. Um, it sat on a 25 foot base, which meant that the entire thing was about the height of a six story building. So it could be seen from a lot of parts of the fairgrounds. If, if you ever go back and look at old Centennial Exposition pictures, every once in a while you'll see a building that looks like it has a cash register sitting on top of it, but it's just this one like looming over everything around it. Um, the bottom of the building contained a showroom for a national cash register, so they would show like adding machines and cash registers and whatever. Uh, the giant cash register itself didn't really have any function except the numbers at the top were wired to the turnstiles at Fair Park. So every hour they would update and they would show you what the attendance was that day. So they kept a running total of how many people had come through the gate. Um, then at the end of the day, the National Catch Register employees would record the day's attendance in a giant ledger book that they displayed down at the bottom of the building. So you could walk by and you could keep, a, keep an eye on how many people had come through. You know, they didn't have TV back then, so they had to keep themselves entertained somehow. Um, as you can imagine, the big cash register was, was popular. Uh, George Dahl, our, our hero architect, was apparently not a huge fan of it um, because Dahl was a little more dignified than this and I think he probably would have looked at that and gone, mm-hmm. Uh, Walter Dorwin Teague had tried to secure a prime spot for the giant cash register, but Dahl's office ended up locating it out of the way of many of the prominent areas of Fair Park. Um, just to orient you, um, here's the amphitheater, the lagoon, the art museum, the midway was up here, and the cash register is kind of off the midway on, on like a side street. Um, this is now Texas Discovery Gardens, so it would have been right across the street from there. So 
it was visible from a lot of places, but it wasn't on a part, or it wasn't in a part of the fairgrounds where like everybody was going to pass by. But you really couldn't miss it. Um, where was Texaco? Texaco was right. Um, let's see, was that Texaco? Yeah, this is Texaco. So um, this is the the end of the Ford building here, and then Texaco started the midway. So the Cotton Bowl's right here, and Texaco would have been right across from the uh, from the lagoon. Um, so National Cash Register, like Ford, uh, did not sign on for the Pan American Exposition. So the building came down immediately after the Centennial Exposition closed, sadly. Um, now Walter Dorwin Teague would go on to design another giant cash register for the World's Fair in New York in 1939. Um, they have color photos of this, which I'll get to later, but um, we don't have any color pictures of the Centennial, which is sad. Um, this cash register in New York got a whole lot of attention, and New Yorkers will tell you that they had the first one, but it wasn't true, Dallas had the first one. But New Yorkers, you know, you know how they are, they don't, they don't like to admit anybody else did anything. But, and actually, I think the one here was kind of better looking than the one in New York, but that's just my opinion. Um, now while we're on the topic of giant cash registers, we might as well stay undignified for a little while. Uh, so let's go over to the Midway, um, which was the, the center of less dignified Fair Park. Um, the 1936 Midway was not the Midway that we know today, not at all. Uh, it was much more substantial. Um, it had shows, arcades, and restaurants, and a hodgepodge of buildings. And, and, you know, when you think of the Midway today, you think of like a booth or you think of a tent. These were actual buildings that you could walk in that, that you know, each had their own function, each had their own design. Um, they were temporary, but, but they were there. Uh, some of the Midway buildings were designed along modernistic lines, and you can get a sense of that here. Um, and, and also a little bit in this postcard. Um, there were others that were, that were not Art Deco at all. Um, they included the Black Forest on the left, which was a uh, fake German village where you could eat German food and watch ice skaters in the summer, uh, which I still don't know how they did. Um, it was outdoors and it was 110 and they still had ice skating somehow. Uh, there was also the black, uh, I'm sorry, Little America on the right, which was uh, supposed to be a loose rendition of Admiral Byrd's Antarctic base. Um, somehow that building was made of ice and it managed to survive the Dallas summer too, I don't know. Um, I wanted to point out though, a couple of the more popular Midway attractions, um, which were both Art Deco and, and were both uh, among the more, uh, the more elaborate Midway things. First of all, there was Midget City, um, and we can all go ahead and cringe at that and get over ourselves. Um, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid it's pretty self-explanatory. What can I say about Midget City? Um, but I will say this, it was not unusual. Midget villages were pretty common at uh, fairs and expositions back then. Um, and, and if you go back you know, into the 1800s, people were just fascinated by, by like colonies of midgets. Um, the idea behind a Midget City or a Midget Village was you know, for the run of the fair, it was set up in this, this really elaborate thing. Everything was like scaled down for, for, for little people and you would basically just go watch them like do their thing. You know, they would, they would live, they would eat, they would work and, and tall people would go in and, and look at them. Um, there are some really awkward uh, clips of newsreel footage where like they, it seems like they found the tallest people at the fair to go and there's one where it looks like a guy is stealing the, the food off the table, but I'm assume that he wasn't doing that. Um, fair Park's Midget City had more than 100 uh, little people bustling around buildings that included a uh, false front uh, department store, which is, is this here, and also a false front Hilton Hotel. Um, these are, and you can get a sense of the scale, by the way, from this, this guy who is like the height of two stories on the, on the department store. Um, these weren't real buildings, you couldn't actually go in them, but they were, you know, like five or six small stories tall, uh, so they, they were pretty big. I'm going to dig myself in a hole here, and I do not want to be in that hole. Um, the, uh, the Fair Park Midget City, in addition to all of this, had uh, Eleanor Stubitz, who was the miniature Mae West. Um, she would appear in what newspapers described as exact scale replicas of dresses that the full-size Mae West wore in her movies. So just think about all you're missing. You can't see soybeans pressed into plastic. You can't see a, a giant ledger book with uh, attendance totals, and you can't see a tiny Mae West. Don't you wish you lived in the 30s? Um, the other Midway feature that I wanted to talk about was one of the most uh, famous or infamous attractions at, at Fair Park. It was the Streets of Paris. 
And the streets of Paris had debuted at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. That's, that's what this is. This is the, the Chicago version. Uh, the show was brought back for the Dallas Fair, and, and both the Chicago and Dallas versions were, were similar. The idea was there was um, like a mock-up of a Parisian street scene, and they had a stage where they did floor shows, and there were cafes, and you could eat. And in the front, there was a mock-up of an ocean liner, um, and, and that was the way that you got into, uh, into the streets of Paris. Uh, so this was the one in Chicago, but I wanted to, to show you the one in Dallas because I think it was way better. Um, this was the one here. It was supposed to be a mock-up of the bow of the ocean liner Normandy, which was the, the famously extravagant liner that had just uh, made its maiden voyage in 1935, the year before. So it was, it was a really big deal, and it would have seemed really swanky to be able to go into the streets of Paris through a fake Normandy. Um, what was in the fake Normandy was um, called the Centennial Club. Uh, it was a three-level private club with a membership fee of $25, which was about $500 in today's money. Um, you could go to the streets of Paris without being a member of the Centennial Club, but only Centennial Club members could sit in the Normandy in air conditioning and watch what was going on from there. Um, and, and if you look, um, this is an aerial picture of the Midway that gives you a better idea of how this was all laid out. So uh, the, the ship was here on a corner, and then this would have been the club, and then here's the outdoor cafe with the floor show, and then you can see what it is is essentially like a, a French movie set that you could walk around and you could go in some of these buildings and, you know, it would have, the idea was it would have looked like you were in Paris. Um, the ocean liner, the, the fake Normandy, also had a liquor store on its ground floor. That's, you can see that here. Um, which brings me to another point. Um, there was a lot of alcohol at the Centennial Exposition. Uh, there was also a surprising amount of risque entertainment, and I don't want to say that the alcohol and the risque entertainment went hand in hand, but maybe. Um, entertainers at the streets of Paris included uh, Mona Leslie, the diving Venus, who uh, did this act where she did a high dive into a pool wearing a pint of olive oil, and that was it. Um, <laughs> and Dealey asked, did the olive oil separate when she went into the water? And now that's all I can think about. Like, what was she wearing when she got out of the pool? Um, there was also a real life Lady Godiva at the streets of Paris. And the gimmick here was that she was supposed to be a Dallas society woman who rode a uh, mast to protect her identity. So the ad is, is, is like, you know, Dallas Deb rides as Godiva. Who is she? Come and see Friday at the preview party. Um, just as a, as a spoiler alert here, uh, she was not a Dallas Society woman. Uh, she was not always masked, because here she is without her mask on, and she was not always the same woman, nor was it always the same horse. Um, they, so, you know, it, it, was, it was always Lady Godiva, but there are many ladies Godiva. Uh, also, I think she was wearing a flesh-colored bodysuit. I don't think she was actually naked, even though they pretended that she was. Um, Mona Leslie, the diving Venus, was definitely naked. Um, <laughs> Over at the Hollywood Nights Review, uh, elsewhere on the Midway, the headliner was the demure Della Carroll, uh, who looks like a wholesome girl. Uh, she uh, arrived in Dallas by parachuting nude into Love Field. That was, <laughs> she was wearing high heels, I should say that. Um, <laughs> which is really, I, I don't know what kind of woman it takes to do that, but. Um, but maybe the most famous Midway entertainer of all was Mademoiselle Corrine, the apple dancer. Um, she was at the Streets of All Nations, which was another uh, Midway attraction, and they called her the apple dancer, but she really wasn't. She did a dance nude holding a gold beach ball in front of her, and I don't know why they called it an apple, but they did. Um, but, but that was her big deal. She was incredibly popular. Uh, she went on to become a, a dancer and a nightclub entertainer in New York and Europe. Um, and I learned from the blog Flashback Dallas uh, that there is a book about her now. She ended up marrying another nightclub entertainer and their son or daughter has, has written a book about them, so who knew? Um, also from Flashback Dallas, I got something that's really apropos of nothing, but I just wanted to put it up because it makes me happy. Um, Mademoiselle Corrine really couldn't get any respect. Um, this is a newspaper clip where she's being inspected by a, uh, a foot doctor and you can see the headline, someone finally looks at her feet. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Um, oh, and I should mention one other thing. Mademoiselle Corrine's opening act at the exposition was the Dancing Debutantes. Uh, it was a group of women who were wearing like antebellum style skirts, and that was it. <laughs> Which I'm sure Scarlett O'Hara would have done if she had thought of it. Um, 
All of this went over well with fairgoers, as you can imagine, but Dallas officials were not so sure about all this. Uh, there was a group of conservative Dallas leaders called the Morality League, and uh, their president made it his personal mission to visit every leg show, that was what they called them, uh, as often as he could so that he could keep up to date on the sin that was being perpetrated at the, at the Centennial Exposition. Uh, he later made a claim with the exposition because he said that they should refund all of his entry fees, and they declined, so he went to the newspapers, and apparently never understood how ridiculous this whole thing was. But anyway, I wanted to mention all of this, not only because it's fun, but because it's part of Lost Fair Park, too. I mean, uh, you don't see this on the Midway anymore, um, <laughs> for better or for worse. But it's, it's just kind of amazing to think that, that this all existed back then. Um, as for the streets of Paris itself, uh, it did survive through the um, Pan American Exposition. Uh, the Normandy had some stuff stuck to it, and it was turned into a Spanish galleon. Uh, the replica French street scene uh, was remodeled as a bull ring, and inexplicably the entire attraction was ne renamed the Road to Rio. So they, they knew that like South America was there, but I don't think they realized that there were different countries and different cultures, so whatever. Um, some of the 1936 Midway buildings were demolished after the Pan Am Exposition, but others held on through at least the 1950s. And this is a picture of the Midway in the mid-60s, and you can see some of what I suspect were, were some of those 1936 buildings still hanging on over here, even though a lot had been demolished. The streets of Paris would have been sort of right back in this area. Um, if you look at photos of the Midway from the 70s, you can even see what appear to be some of these old buildings still hanging on. So they've all been cleared now, and, and none of this is there, but it's amazing to think that some of these lasted as long as they did. So leaving the Midway, sadly, uh, we're gonna move over to the area around the Hall of State, uh, right out front of, of where we are here. You would think not much had changed there since 1936, and that is true of the Hall of State itself, but not true of its surroundings. Um, the Hall of State as it was built in 1936, first of all, wasn't called the Hall of State. It was called the State of Texas Building because it was an exhibit of, of Texas history. Uh, but it fronted on what was known as the Texas Court of Honor, which is the area just outside where there are the fountains now where people can park. Um, it was um, a better defined space in 1936 than it is now, uh, thanks in large part to this building, which stood at the north end. So if you walked out of the Hall of State today and turned to your right, where there's a parking lot now, there would have been uh, the Hall of Petroleum, which is, which is this. Um, the building, you may notice, has a sign that says Humble's Hall of Texas History. Humble Oil was the big exhibitor here, so it was called the Hall of Petroleum officially, but Humble called it the Hall of Texas History unofficially. Um, it wasn't a spectacular building, but it did do an important thing for the Court of Honor. It, uh, it acted as a, as a terminus here. So this is looking at the building from the back. Here's the Court of Honor stretching out in front of the Hall of State. And then you can see the Ford Building does the same thing at the other end. So you have these bookends for this space. And that Court of Honor, uh, this space combined with what was called the Federal Concourse over here, really provided a big circulation area for uh, Fair Park. Um, this is, is another, another part of the exposition map that has the space highlighted in blue. Um, the idea was you'd come in typically off the streetcar down here at Perry Avenue, come in the front gate, walk along the Esplanade of State, and you would end up in this area. And from here, you could go around to the agricultural exhibits this way, you could go to the Hall of State here, you could go down to the museums, you could go to the Midway, you could go around to the Lagoon. So that was, this was kind of the, the space that took you to all parts of Fair Park. So it was really important, and it had you know, important buildings at either end, or, or important looking buildings at either end. Um, and that's another thing that I, that I wanted to mention. It's easy to forget now, but Fair Park was laid out along old and established, classically inspired lines. They really made a big effort to, to do plazas and avenues and, and streets that had vistas, and there was the idea that you know, you'd look down this way and you'd see something at the end of the street or, or where a street would turn, there would be a tower. Um, the idea was not only to be impressive, because everywhere you looked there was something else to see, but also it was a way to help you find your way around Fair Park. Because if you had these landmarks you could identify, like the cash register. If you could see the cash register and you knew where it was, you could find your way back there. We've lost some of that as we've lost these temporary buildings, and so it's not, in a, in a way, it's better because you can do a lot more flexible things with Fair Park when there aren't all these buildings in the way, but in a way it's worse because you're not experiencing it the way that they wanted you to experience it in 1936. So I don't know, you know which way is preferable, but it's just, it's just different. Um, 
The Court of Honor also originally had uh, some pretty cool lighting features. Um, these, these things here were, were lighting features, and then these were uh, planters that had scenes of Texas flora and fauna on them. Um, those were all um, temporary as well. They were, they were torn down after the exposition. Um, you can see them again here in this scene from a movie called The Big Show, which was partially filmed uh, during the centennial. But they're, um, this is actually Roy Rogers, right? Yes. Yeah, Roy Rogers. Um, Gene Autry. Gene Autry. I knew I was going to do that. It's Gene Autry uh, being driven in a parade in front of the Hall of State, and so you can see uh, the light standards and the, the planters back here. Um, so all that's gone, so, so that space looks a lot different. Um, and there is one other thing that I wanted to mention about the Hall of State, which is not really a case of a lost building. It's more of a, of a never built thing. Um, the original drawings of the Hall of State called for two wings sticking out of the front of the building. Um, and if you look at the Hall of State now, it does look like it needs these because you, you can kind of see how they had, it, it just looks like the building stops on either end. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this building, but um, they, the idea was that this is, this is basically the Hall of State as we know it today from, from here to here. They were going to add or, or build an additional 100 feet on either end of the building and then have this wing and this wing. Um, they would have contained additional exhibit space. Uh, they would have helped to define that forecourt in front of the building, and they would have made the building just look a little bit more, more balanced. But uh, it was either a question of time or money that, that led them to not build this. They did lay the foundations for it so they could build it, but it was, it was never built. But it's kind of interesting to think about what might have been if we had two more exhibit halls in the Hall of State. Now, not far from here uh, was perhaps the largest lost uh, building at Fair Park. It was the Hall of Varied Industries, Communications, and Electricity. Uh, it's the building on the right here on the Esplanade, one of the two giant exhibit halls there. Um, the principal facade that, that faced onto the Esplanade here was designed to mirror the facade of the what was then called the Hall of Transportation that's now the Centennial Building over here on the other side of the Esplanade. But there was a lot more going on here than, than met the eye. Uh, and that's because the Varied Industries Building was actually an enlarged and heavily remodeled older structure, this one, the Automobile and Manufacturers Building from 1922. Um, the Hall of Transportation on the other side of the Esplanade, by the way, was also an enlarged and remodeled older building, so it's interesting to think the Esplanade used to look completely different than it does now. Um, what's interesting about this remodeling project is George Dahl's office gave the 1922 building a big addition. Um, this is the building here, and all of this was built for 1936. Here's the 1922 building running at an angle, and they wrapped part of it in a deco facade around here, and then basically the rest of this they just left looking like it looked in 1922. And it kind of looked like a giant Spanish mission, so um, at the far end down here, they tucked in the Rio Grande Valley exhibit and used this as a backdrop for it. Um, the Rio Grande Valley exhibit was basically a model home and a garden, and it was behind the old mill uh, building, which is, which is still there. Um, like the Hall of Transportation across the Esplanade, varied industries included large-scale artwork, and in this case it was uh, murals and reliefs by an artist named Pierre Bordel. Uh, there was this relief of a cowboy and a, and a horse. Uh, there was this three-part mural called Prometheus, which is a little bit hard to see, but it's a guy uh, representing like electric generation. He's got lightning bolts all around him. And then there was this large relief called Builders, which represents the construction trades. Uh, these works were all lost in January, I'm sorry, February of 1942 when this building burned to the ground. Um, there was a fire that started overnight. The fire department responded, but they had low water pressure and, and there wasn't anything that they could do. Uh, all that survived of this building were the statues, France, Mexico, and United States uh, that faced the Esplanade, and a pair of modernistic light pylons at the east end of the building. So what we now know as the automobile building was built on part of the old building's footprint in 1948. Uh, these are pictures of it, and as you can see, they didn't make any attempt to make it look like the, the rest of the Esplanade. Um, what's interesting is, here are the two modernistic light towers, and then you can see the statues they kept, but behind it, they just kind of went, eh. Um, they, they didn't try to match it. Uh, the, the building did not get the facade that we know now until 1986, and this building is actually still behind it, but they, they built a, a replica of the 1936 facade in front of it to make it match the transportation building across the way. Uh, at the time that that facade was built, or actually a little bit later, 
Uh, six of Pierre Bordel's murals were recreated under the porticos. Um, the uh, artists used Bordel's original glass slides for these, which were donated by his son. So they did what Bordel had done in 1936. They projected the slides up on the side of the building and they painted them in. Um, so they're fantastic, but just keep in mind, they're not the originals, they're, they're recreations of the originals. And we're gonna talk a little bit more later about other uh, recreated and restored artwork, but there's, there's a good bit of it out here. Um, now, of course, there are other things that have been lost at Fair Park, and some of it is Art Deco, some of it isn't. A lot of it will be familiar uh, if you've been in Dallas for a while, and thinking back on it, I'm not sure any of you have been in Dallas long enough to remember some of these, but, but maybe you've heard of them. Uh, there was the Globe Theater, which was a replica of the Globe Theater in London. Uh, it stuck around through the 1940s. Uh, Dallas Theater Incorporated bought it, and uh, you've probably heard of Margot Jones and her theater whatever. Um, this was where that started. So this was like Theater 41, Theater 42, uh, kind of in the, the early run. Um, Dallas Theater Inc. eventually uh, tore it down. Uh, there was a lot of public outcry about that because a lot of people really liked this building, uh, but they said they needed a more up-to-date facility. Uh, elsewhere on the grounds, there was the Texas Rangers building, which was essentially a giant log cabin. Um, if you've been in Dallas for a long time, you may remember that this became the driver's license office, and that was where you go to get your driver's license. Um, there was also a building that I have never seen a picture of, and we have tried to find one and no luck. It was the WPA building, which showed exhibits from uh, the Works Progress Administration that was in full swing in 1936. This one um, is really interesting. It was designed by a fairly prominent architect, uh, David Williams. It had uh, murals in it by a well-known artist named Julia Eckel. Um, and the WPA was really meticulous about photographing everything that it did, except for this. Um, we tried the National Archives, we tried the local WPA archives, and all we found was a rendering from the Dallas Morning News, which is what you see here. Um, this building uh, became a naval exhibit after the Centennial Exposition. It was used as a uh, armory and training facility for uh, the Texas Defense Guard during the war. Uh, it had a fire in 1946 and it was demolished in 1948. So none of you will remember it, but if you ever run across a picture of this, call me immediately and I'll come to wherever you are and get it. Uh, there was also the Contemporary House, which I really like. This was another Art Deco building. It was one of four Centennial model homes that were built to showcase different uh, types of building material and different styles of, of houses um, that the idea was you could come and you could see a house and you could go back home and build it yourself. Uh, the Contemporary House was designed by uh, a Dallas architecture firm, DeWitt and Washburn. Uh, it was furnished by Neiman Marcus, because, you know, normal people live there. Uh, it cost, <laughs> I mean, my house is furnished by Neiman's, I don't know about yours. Uh, it cost $15,000, which was a good bit of money back then. It was not supposed to be just a run-of-the-mill house. It was supposed to show you how you could live well. Um, it had up-to-date features like bathrooms on both floors and air conditioning. Um, it was also designed specifically to respond to the North Texas climate. So this side that you see here um, is almost all windows. And if you could see the other side, it had virtually no windows. So the idea was the other side was where the sun would hit. This was the side where you could live without roasting alive in your house. Um, it was a pretty popular, oh yeah. <laughs> you never know when it's gonna show up. Um, it's so discreet, it just like pops up every once in a while. Um, this was a, another popular exhibit. People were really into this because it was an up-to-date house. Um, and it, it has stayed around in, in the public eye so much or in the public mind so much that there is a rumor about it. Uh, the rumor is that it was bought and moved to 6851 Gaston Avenue in Lakewood. Um, and there are people who should know better who have written that this house was moved to Gaston Avenue. This is the house on Gaston. It does resemble the contemporary house, but it isn't the contemporary house. It was built in 1936, designed by a completely different architecture firm, and it has never been anywhere but, but where it is. Um, but it's kind of interesting that that, that was a story that came up. Um, now, the contemporary house stayed open through the Pan Am Exposition. After that, uh, DeWitt and Washburn, the architects, actually owned the house, and they donated it to the Girl Scouts, and the Girl Scouts used it as their building uh, until 1949, and after that it was torn down. So the Girl Scouts had some pretty fancy digs for a while. Um, so as I said, this was one of four model homes. The other three model homes are still with us, even though two are no longer at Fair Park anymore. Um, 
This was one of them, the Southern Pine House, built out of wood. Um, it is now located at 3003 Kenmore, uh, just south of I-30, a few blocks east of here. Uh, it was moved, obviously. Um, there's also another house that was moved to Gaston Avenue, just a couple of blocks away from where the contemporary house isn't. Um, this, it was the Masonite house, and I don't know if you're familiar with Masonite, it was like a hardboard that you could use to, to build, and the Masonite house was completely made out of Masonite, which seems like a good idea, but maybe not. Um, it was moved to 6901 Gaston, it is still there, but it was covered in stucco at some point, and now it is surrounded by trees, so you can't see it, and even if you could, you wouldn't recognize it, but that's what it looked like on the inside. The fourth Centennial model home was the Portland Cement House, which was made out of concrete, and it is still there. Um, it's in Texas Discovery Gardens now, and it's a little um, building that they use for storage, and they also use it as like a prep area for events that are happening in the gardens. Um, but if you wander back into the Discovery Gardens, you'll come across it. So what's interesting about this is um, it's been reported here and there that, you know, the Contemporary House was moved. We know the other two houses were moved. Um, the Portland Cement House is the one that people consistently say was torn down. But that's, that's the one that they're actually wrong about. And anyway, um, but it is, it's still back there. Um, speaking of not believing everything you read, uh, I want to talk about one more lost Fair Park building that um, attracted a lot of attention in its day. It, it caused some controversy when it was demolished and it still captures people's attention. It is the Hall of Negro Life, and it was the first building at a major American fair that was dedicated to the history and culture of African Americans. Um, there's a lot more to the story of the Hall of Negro Life than we have time for tonight, but I wanted to touch on some of the high points of this. Um, the building had its origin basically as soon as plans started being floated for the Centennial Exposition. Um, Dallas's black leaders heard that, that there was going to be this exposition here. They started pushing for official inclusion at the exposition, uh, but they didn't get very far with uh, the exposition planners. They, they you know, kind of got put off and put off and put off and, and were getting frustrated. They didn't really get anywhere until they found an ally on the, um, the exposition planning committee. It was a guy named Walter Klein from Wichita Falls who was an oil man, and he told the, the Dallas black leaders, what you ought to do is sell $50,000 in exhibition bonds, exposition bonds, sorry, and that will show the committee, the planning committee, that you're serious about this, and then if you do that, I'll put in a good word for you and make sure that this building gets built. So they did, and he did, and the result was there was a $100,000 allocation from the federal government for the Hall of Negro Life. Um, that was $50,000 for the building itself and then $50,000 for overhead and staffing and exhibits and, and everything that went into it. Um, like I said, the first um, exhibit building at a major fair dedicated to African American exhibits, so it was a pretty big deal. Um, the locals were never super excited about this. They talked about it eventually and, and acknowledged that it was probably a good thing, but they always made sure to call it the Federal Negro Building. They wanted to make sure that you knew that that was where the money came from. Uh, the building was about 14,000 square feet, so it was not one of the biggest exhibit buildings by far, but it wasn't the smallest either. It was, it was pretty good size. Um, George Dahl's office designed it. Uh, they, they did it in the same pared down modern style as the other exhibit buildings, and inside there were exhibits from 32 states and the District of Columbia that dealt with uh, African American contributions to education, fine arts, health, agriculture, mechanical arts, and business. And the focal point of the building was the entry hall um, that led to two exhibit rooms off to either side. The exhibit hall, or I'm sorry, the entry hall was decorated with four murals by the New York artist Aaron Douglas, who was one of the leading artists of the Harlem Renaissance. And a really famous artist uh, in his own right. Um, two of the Douglas murals still exist. The other two might, but I don't think anybody knows for sure that, that they do or not. Um, these two are in museums in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Uh, the one on the left is called Into Bondage. The one on the right is called Aspiration. And they're tremendous works of art on top of everything else. Wouldn't it be nice if they were still here or if we had all four? But you can take a trip to San Francisco and Washington and see them, and that's a good excuse to go on vacation. Um, like I said, we don't know about the other two murals. The, these were all uh, dispersed when the building was torn down. They, they went into private hands, and someone may have the other two somewhere and just isn't saying, but as far as I know, nobody's ever, nobody's ever said anything about it. Um, I think it's worth mentioning 
that there were a lot of rumors and misconceptions about this building from the get-go. And I'm spending more time on this one because, number one, it was a really important building, but number two, I think this shows us how legends and, and urban myths can grow up around these things. Um, one early example of, of misunderstandings, if I guess that's a nice way to put it, about this building uh, happened when the building was still under construction. Um, the, uh, all of the exposition buildings or the, the larger exhibit halls were supposed to have fire hoses in them for, for fire suppression. Uh, that came from George Dahl's office and it was just the law of the land. The contractor for this building put in fire extinguishers but not fire hoses. And when Dahl's office asked him about it, he said, well, this is good enough. And they said, no, it's, it's really not. Um, they gave him a deadline to put in the fire hoses and he refused to do it and they started fining him $100 a day and it took him eight days before he agreed to do what he was supposed to do. Um, Jesse Thomas, who was the manager of the building, uh, later wrote, it took the contractor eight days to make up his mind that even in erecting a building to be occupied by Negroes, the letter of the law had to be complied with. Um, there's a horrible story about how the contractor also decided on his own to paint the interior of the building red and green, which was not at all the uh, exposition color scheme. And when Dahl's office asked him about it, he said, well, they're never going to be able to fill it up. And I understand they like bright colors. So <laughs> they made him go in and repaint it, rightfully so. Uh, later on, the building was set to have its grand opening on June 19th, which is uh, Juneteenth. It was two weeks after the exposition opened, but they liked the symbolism of the date. Um, but rumors started flying because when people showed up and the building was not open, of course, what else are you going to do? Uh, some people decided that the building must have been condemned. Some people decided that the managers of the building had run off with the money and left town. Um, all of that was despite the fact that there was a sign that says open for inspection June 19th, exhibits being installed. But, you know, why go read a sign when you don't have to? Uh, poor Jesse Thomas, the manager, said that the rumors were so persistent that there were people insisting that the building would never open three months after it had opened. Um, I, guess, I guess they hadn't made it over there yet. Um, once the building opened, a story began to circulate about how it had originally been built with segregated restrooms. And the story was that the building managers saw the segregated restrooms and said, well, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. And so they integrated the restrooms and everybody could use the restrooms together happily. It's actually not a bad story, um, but it's not true. The building was built with one set of restrooms and the story, the, the true story is good enough. Um, it had the first integrated restrooms in Dallas. And it was a little bit of a novelty for people at first. You could read accounts of people going, you know, oh, gee, I used the, I used the bathroom with, with one of them on both sides. Um, but after that, it was just no big deal. People just went and they said they had no problems. It did make Dallas leaders nervous because the last thing they wanted was for people to be fine using the restroom with everybody else. So um, there was a lot of unease in official circles around this building. Um, and of course, the reason I'm talking about this today at all is because it was demolished. Uh, there was some confusion and controversy around that because it seems most everybody, including the management of the, the Hall of Negro Life, was expecting the building to remain open for the Pan American Exposition in 1937. Uh, exhibits had been arranged for 1937. There was still money in the budget to keep the building open. Um, they, they were just planning on going ahead like normal, but word came early in 1937 that the building would not be open and it was ordered to be torn down. So the, uh, the management of the building started asking questions. Um, local leaders said, well, the feds told us to do this. And the feds said, no, local leaders wanted us to do this. Um, there was actually a presidential inquiry into this and they basically came back and said, eh, who knows? Um, in the end, uh, Jesse Thomas, who's the, the building manager, concluded that there were one or more influential Dallasites who did not want to see the building open for another year. And he wrote, I know who these people are, but I'm not going to tell you who they are because he didn't think that was proper. But uh, apparently it was, it was fairly widely known in certain circles. Um, Jesse Thomas's conclusion was this. He said, some strange things happened. And with all amounts of investigation, we are not yet absolutely sure the primary cause for the discontinuing of Negro participation. Um, so that was his diplomatic response. Uh, more recently, historian Michael Phillips put it this way in his book, Quite Metropolis. He said, the Hall of Negro life proved too dangerous to survive. And I think that's probably more to the point. Um, more than 80 years after the building was torn down, there are still rumors and misconceptions about it. And sometimes it seems like there's more every day. Um, it has been written 
that the Hall of Negro Life was deliberately sited in an out of the way corner of Fair Park, uh, that it wasn't lit at night like the other exhibit halls were, and my personal favorite, well no, my second favorite, it was surrounded by trees so nobody would be able to find it. Um, I guess the location is, is a matter of, opin of opinion to some extent. Here is uh, Fair Park in 1936. If you zoom in, um, you can see where the building was. Um, this is the main gate, Perry Avenue. Here's the music hall. Um, this was the Varied Industries building, the Globe Theater, and here's Negro Life down here. So it's not on the Esplanade, but it's certainly not in an out of the way corner. It's very close to the front of the fair. Um, and it got a lot of traffic. People didn't seem to have any trouble finding it. Um, it was uh, lit in the same manner as the other exhibit buildings. In fact, on June the 6th, opening day of the fair, when they turned the lights on for the first time, it lit up first, which I don't know if there was any significance in that, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, there are photos that show it lit up at night, so we know that that was true. And speaking of photos, this picture shows that the building was not, in fact, surrounded by trees. Um, it was, in fact, it didn't have any trees around it at all. Um, I think I know where the story came from, though. This thing over here was a swimming pool, um, which had existed before the exposition, and they weren't using it during the, the fair, so they planted trees around it to hide it. Um, it has been said a lot that the Hall of Negro Life was located where the African American Museum stands today, but the truth is the African American Museum is where the swimming pool was, and so I think people have just sort of conflated all this, and they think that, that this building was surrounded by trees, but, but it really wasn't. Um, it has also been said that the Hall of Negro Life was the only building to be demolished uh, between the 1936 and 1937 expositions, but that wasn't true. Remember, the cash register went, and some of the concession buildings did, and people have also claimed that everything about this building was meant to marginalize and demoralize African Americans. And I don't want to get too deep into that because, again, I think that can be a subjective thing, but I will caution you, you have to think about this from 1936 terms, not from 2018 terms, and that doesn't excuse everything that happened in 1936, but based on contemporary descriptions and reviews from both um, African Americans and whites, the Hall of Negro Life was viewed with pride. Um, they thought it was a pretty progressive thing to have. They praised the quality of its content. They also uh, talked about the fact that the building existed at all in the South in the 1930s. Um, and it's worth mentioning, just as a side note, the entire Centennial Exposition was integrated. Um, state fair and county fairs had what they called Negro Days, which was when African Americans could come, but they were welcome at any time during the Centennial Exposition. There were some restrictions. There were restrictions on where African Americans could eat and which midway attractions they could go to, but they could attend, and that was, that was a pretty big deal. Um, there is one more thing I want to mention about this building before we move on. There's a recent story that the building was burned to the ground deliberately at the end of the Centennial Exposition. That's exciting, but that is also not true. They couldn't find it. It was surrounded by trees. How could they burn it down? Um, one more last uh, bit of Lost Fair Park that I want to bring up. It was the lighting from the Centennial Exposition. And it's not quite as tangible as some of the other things that we've talked about, but it was just as important. Um, the lighting scheme for Fair Park was the work of C.M. Cutler, who was a lighting engineer with General Electric, and GE also provided all of the light bulbs for the exposition. Uh, one interesting thing about the lighting here was um, George Dahl really did not like exposed light bulbs. He thought that they were tacky. So he ordered almost all the lighting at Fair Park to be indirect. Um, so the idea was you would never see where the light was coming from. Look around this room. Um, all the lighting in here is indirect, just for that reason. Uh, and that gets overlooked a lot, but it, it kind of makes sense when you start looking at old pictures. Um, that resulted in some really interesting light fixtures. You can see some of them here. These white things are actually light standards. Um, the lights would have been concealed in the bottom. They would have shined up this way and they would have bounced off the top part and then sort of washed down onto the sidewalks. Um, you can see three of them here in another view of uh, what was called Grand Plaza just inside the Perry Avenue gate. Um, there were also uh, eight other different types of, of modernistic light standards across the grounds. Um, I don't think any of them have survived, but I wish some of them had. I'm going to go back to the Texaco building just for a second to show you this. Um, here are two other designs that are really weird. Um, but the way these worked is there were lights on the top of each of these, and they would shine up and bounce off of the thing on top of them. So um, they kind of remind me of lily pads or something. But um, those, those are all gone as far as I know. You, you can see some old-fashioned sort of 
kind of street lighty things that are out on the fairgrounds, and those were here in 1936, but I think those are the only things that, uh, that have survived of, of these. There are some smaller lighting features uh, that have been recreated. Um, these reflectors along the esplanade, the idea is, again, light comes up from the bottom, bounces off, and hits the sidewalk. Uh, those were gone, but they were restored, uh, I'm sorry, rebuilt when the uh, esplanade was restored in 2009. So they're recreations of the, of the 1936. But the star of the lighting at Fair Park was this, the uh, nightly light show on the Esplanade of State, which I, when we were talking about this earlier, this is what I wish I could see. Because this is, Dealey had asked me earlier, what's the one thing you really wish you could walk through? I wish I could walk through this. Um, you, you can get a sense of what this was like in this photo, but what you miss is the color. Um, the, the, the color was just amazing. The, the, the reflecting pool was green. The fountains that fed into it were gold. Um, all of the exhibit buildings were flood lit in the entire spectrum. So they would, the lights would constantly cycle through all the colors of the rainbow. Um, the statues had spotlights on them, so they were constant uh, colors. And then behind the uh, Hall of State back here was a fan of 24 searchlights in different colors. And they moved, so you also don't get a sense of that. But it was like Hollywood back there. Um, the uh, searchlights were visible from miles away. This is what they looked like from White Rock, um, which is pretty cool. They said on a clear night you could see them from Tyler, which is pretty incredible. Um, it must have been spectacular. Uh, exposition visitors regularly said that the lighting was their favorite thing about the exposition. They would do these um, daily or weekly surveys of people at the fair, and this was the thing people kept coming back to. One visitor said, uh, this is the nearest approach that man has ever made to a gorgeous Texas sunset, which I think is pretty nice. Um, unfortunately, this goes back to my beef earlier, the Centennial Exposition's PR staff made a conscious decision not to take any photos in color. Uh, Kodachrome film had just been introduced and they said, well, this is a fad, nobody will go for this, let's not use it. Um, so the 1939 World's Fair three years later was heavily color photographed and there are these beautiful full color images and we have black and white. The closest thing we have for the Esplanade lighting is postcards that were hand tinted. So this is not a color photo, but this is the artist impression of what uh, the color version of this would have looked like. And again, it just would have been spectacular. It would have been gaudy, but it would have been spectacular. Um, it does seem that the Esplanade light show, uh, or at least a version of it, was used again during the Pan American Exposition in 1937. Uh, when Fair Park went back to being the state fairgrounds in 1938, the lighting uh, was much more subdued. Um, apparently, the state fair did bring Cutler, the lighting engineer, back to recreate the Centennial light show once in the 1950s. I don't know how extensive that was. I haven't seen any pictures, but some version of this did happen one more time. Uh, but as far as I know, it's never happened since then. But if anybody has some uh, searchlights that they want to put behind the Hall of State, I'm sure we could work something out. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things at Fair Park that are completely gone, but there are a few other things that are partially gone or, or partially lost, and I wanted to touch on those for a few minutes. Um, the best example of this is the former Hall of Religion, which now houses the Fair Park administrative offices. Um, I don't know if you know this building. It's over sort of close to the uh, music hall. Um, if you come in First Avenue and you drive this way, you'll pass it on your right. Um, back in 1936, it was surrounded by other uh, attractions, uh, but it now has a big parking lot as its neighbor, so it's not as, it's not as well sited as it used to be. Uh, the Religion Building contained exhibits from all the major denominations except Catholicism. Uh, the Catholics had their own building over in the back part of the uh, grounds. And even though it was designed very much in the style of the other exhibition buildings, it was a private building. It was paid for by the Lone Star Gas Company. So Lone Star Gas built the building and then they invited all the different religious groups in to use it. Um, Lone Star Gas also had what was described as a very tasteful and discreet exhibit of its own inside where who knows what that was. Um, there was also a chapel and meeting room with an organ, and the tower on the building contained 25 chimes that were played throughout the day by a person at a keyboard. Um, unfortunately, despite what this uh, postcard shows, there was never actually a fire on top of the tower. I wish there were. I guess it makes sense since it was the Lone Star Gas Building, but that was just an artist's rendition, and, and that never happened. Um, and by the way, that, that's kind of an interesting thing. When you look at some of the postcards from the Centennial, Remember what I said about how they were designing buildings as they were building them? As a result, some of the postcards went out early with earlier renderings, and so the postcards show buildings that never looked that way. 
but I guess it didn't matter because it was a postcard. Um, the Hall of Religion was a hospitality building. Here's the tower without the fire. Um, a hospitality building during the Pan American Exposition. Uh, Lone Star Gas used it during the State Fair for many years after that. Um, I don't know if any of you ever went there to get a cookbook, but I understand that was a big deal to do for a while. Uh, later, the building became a visitor center for Fair Park. Uh, it served as the temporary home of the African American Museum and later of Dallas Historical Society while their buildings were being worked on. And at some point, for some reason, a large chunk of the Hall of Religion was torn down. Um, so what we have now is the left-hand part of the building, but not the right-hand two-thirds, which should be over here. Um, and that leaves the building looking sort of lopsided. Um, we have the part that had the main entrance and has the tower, but it's supposed to be balanced out by this wing and courtyard that haven't been there in a long time. Uh, there have been proposals over the years to rebuild the demolished section, but, uh, but again, obviously, those haven't gone anywhere. Um, now, I think I would put some of the art from the Centennial into the partially lost category as well. Um, you know that a lot of work has been done in the last few years to restore uh, art at fairgrounds, uh, like the Bordell murals that we talked about earlier, but there are still some pieces that need to be brought back. And this is one. It's a mural that's called Peacock and Fowl, for obvious reasons. Um, it was painted over the entrance to the poultry building, which is part of livestock building number one over in the agricultural area. Uh, the artist here was Carlo Campaglia, who was the head muralist for the Centennial. And this is what Peacock and Fowl looks like today. Um, it's still under there, though. They have done a little bit of exploratory work, and so it could be restored. It just hasn't yet. Uh, it's waiting for funding. Not too far away, there is another Campalia mural that has been restored. It's called Pollination of Nature, and it used to look like that thing I just showed you, but the paint was taken off and the mural was brought back. Uh, this was restored in 2000, and this is on the former Hall of Agriculture, which is now the Food and Fiber Building. Um, around on the front side of Food and Fiber, there's a larger set of Campalia murals called Wheat Harvesters, and that's the one on the left, and Fecundity, which is the one on the right. Um, these were also restored as part of the uh, building restoration project in 2000 and 2001. And one thing that I wanted to point out before we move on, Campalia was a really talented artist, and he was especially known for his baby portraits, and I just wanted to show you why. Because who wouldn't want a lopsided picture of their baby? Um, he really was a talented artist, just ignore that. Um, just across the way, um, there's another pair of Campalia murals. It's not nice to pick on him, is it? But I don't think he minds. Um, there's another pair of Campalia murals under the portico of the Hall of Foods, which is now the Embarcadero building. Uh, these are covered up currently. They still need to be uncovered. The one with the giant woman over here is called Abundance. And then I don't know the title of this one, but it's, it's related to foods. Um, they're covered up with paint. They're, they've been painted over. So how would they get the paint off to restore? Oh, art restorers can do a lot of things. They, yeah, art restorers know how to get the paint off. I wouldn't, but, but they do. Um, so, um, whoop. Yeah, these two murals. Uh, if you go around um, to the uh, north side of the Embarcadero building, there is another uh, lost giant woman. Um, she was... She's very frightening. She was in this niche on the north entrance to the building, and she would have filled it um, so she's under, under paint as well. She and her little pet farmer who's in her hand here. Um, so all of this, you know, the idea is that all of this will be uncovered when there's funding available to do it. Um, in the lobby of this building, the Embarcadero building, there is something that's potentially even more interesting, which is this wall. Fascinating. Um, it actually contains a mural, and you can see where they've scraped off little bits of the paint to get at what's under there. What is interesting about this one, and I think this is still true today, nobody knows what this mural is. Um, there has never been a photo or a drawing of what it was found, so when this is restored, it's also going to be a discovery, which is going to be pretty cool. Uh, it's worth mentioning the original decorative scheme in this lobby, all of this color and these patterns, that's all recreations of the 1936 uh, decorative scheme that was done uh, when this building was restored in 2005. Um, one more bit of lost art, which is a personal favorite of mine, this is over in the federal building, the tower building right next door. It was the rotunda. Um, the rotunda was the area that led into the exhibit hall for federal agencies back in 1936. Um, the decoration here was designed by an artist named Julian Garnsey, and it consists of um, a ceiling that's painted with 48 stars to represent the 48 states of the Union back then. Um, there are also on the, the walls here modernistic murals that deal with uh, 
the northern, southern, eastern, and western United States. So it's allegorical figures showing things that went on in those parts of the country. Um, if you go in there today, this is what the space looks like. Um, almost all of Garnsey's work, well actually all of Garnsey's work has long since been painted over, but if you look really carefully at the ceiling and if you start looking at the walls, you will see they've uncovered a little bit of, of this. So this is all still under there. Um, here's a star and a couple of chevrons they've uncovered and then portions of the murals on the walls. So this is another space that is in line to be restored when there's funding available. Um, one other side note here, these square things that you see, these are panels that were taken out of the Baker Hotel uh, before it was demolished. So they have absolutely nothing to do with Fair Park, but I'm glad they're there. Um, so the question that you might be asking yourself is this, why would they paint over all of this? Um, because it was beautiful, why would you get rid of it? The answer is really easy, because painting over it was a lot easier than keeping it up. Um, studies on the paints that were used for the murals back in 1936 show that they probably faded or flaked pretty quickly. This is the only color picture I've ever seen of the Centennial Exposition itself. This is a snapshot taken by one of the visitors and it's showing the foods building. You can see the mural under here is still in good shape, but look at this. Look at what the, the painted trim is doing. So this is just like four or five months after it was painted and it's already starting to come off the building. Um, photos show us that the murals were still visible around 1940 this was uh, the former agriculture building that's now food and fiber, but at the time it was poultry. But you can see the mural is still there. Um, but within a couple of years, the murals would be painted over because the state fair just did not want to keep up with them. And you, I don't know if you noticed, but there's supposed to be painted trim up here and around here, and that has already been covered up in this 1940 picture. Uh, so they were, they were starting. Um, the new paint that they used was lead-based. It was very hard, and that meant that it was super durable, so they wouldn't have to paint over it again for a while. Um, remember, Fair Park had gone back to being the home of the State Fair, and uh, I don't know whether the State Fair would have preferred to, to keep all this. I'd like to think that they would have, but I think given the choice of putting their money into maintaining murals or putting on a really great State Fair, they picked really great State Fair. Uh, which makes a whole lot of sense. Um, over the years, the buildings at Fair Park were covered with layer after layer of paint, sometimes uh, up to 12 different coats. Um, the murals had not been visible for years by the, by the 1970s. Uh, this picture is actually from the 60s. Uh, but they had not been completely forgotten. Some people remembered them and some people wondered if they were still there. In 1978, uh, crews were sandblasting the former Hall of Transportation on the Esplanade and they discovered this, the Seal of Texas, which is under the portico of Texas, kind of on the backside. Uh, it didn't look like this, it was in pretty bad condition, but a, uh, basically an artist, a young man who was passing by, was like, I could restore that. Um, he had uh, no formal artistic training. He had painted a couple of murals in bars in San Antonio, but they let him have a go at it. Um, his method of restoring it was to use acrylic spray paint. Uh, he did, and that was all taken off and it was restored by professionals uh, later. So this is what it looks like today. Um, no disrespect to that guy. I really respect his pluck for doing that, but still. Um, so the buildings had been painted over. People were starting to forget what they had looked like. Art Deco had gone out of fashion. Um, on top of all of this, the city was doing its best to demolish Fair Park, and the State Fair at times was doing its best to demolish Fair Park. I could show you proposal after proposal that would horrify you of expressways running through the park and all the buildings being torn down and the Cotton Bowl moving here and a freeway running there. And it was just like every couple of years they come out with a plan to either plow a freeway through uh, tear everything down or both, but they never had the money to do any of it. So it wasn't that they loved the architecture, it was that they could never get the scratch together to tear everything down. Uh, finally, thanks to a combination of things, uh, a renewed interest in Art Deco, a focus on Texas history that came with the sesquicentennial in 1986, and the absolutely horrible condition of some of the buildings at Fair Park, which were literally about to fall down, uh, a preservation movement began. Um, it was backed by a series of bond issues and grants, supported by the city and by groups like Friends of Fair Park, uh, which formed to support the restoration of the park and to promote the park as a year-round destination. Um, this movement on the Esplanade 
resulted in the restoration of the Campalia murals on the Hall of Transportation. These are three of those. Uh, and the restoration of the Bordell murals that I showed you earlier across the way. Um, elsewhere at Fair Park, statuary and murals were either taken back to their 1936 appearance or they were recreated using original uh, drawings and photos and models. These are on the, uh, what's now called the Centennial Building. So if you look out from the Hall of State, they're on the right-hand building. They're under the porticos. Um, they're absolutely worth seeing. They're fantastic. Um, the, and these all have to do with transportation. The Bordell ones I showed you earlier have to do with technology. Um, restoration projects in this period included the spirit of the Centennial at the old administration building, which most recently was the Women's Museum up near the front gate. Um, this had been sculpted by Raoul José and Pierre Bordel. Um, it was actually done in plaster over a metal framework, and so it was in really terrible condition, but it was completely restored. Um, she's looking pretty bad here. Um, I don't know why, by the way, this is supposed to be modeled after Botticelli's Venus, but she's standing on a cactus, which is both uncomfortable and not accurate because we don't have that kind of cactus in Texas, but you let French people do a statue of Texas and this is what they come up with. Um, over on the Esplanade, uh, closer to the Hall of State, sculptor David Newton uh, recreated, uh, I'm sorry, created new versions of two statues, tenor and contralto, that had been done by Lawrence Tinney Stevens back in 1936. Uh, they were metal originally, and I think, I suspect they were probably uh, taken down during the war uh, for scrap metal. That's, I, I, I don't have anything to back that up, but I just feel like that's what happened. Um, so David Newton did, uh, did these. Behind them, these blue and red things that you see are recreations of the 1936 loudspeakers. Uh, they were called the Singing Towers, and they were actually all over the fairgrounds, but these two had the statues attached to them because the statues were supposed to represent sound coming out of the speakers, so they recreated those along with the, uh, with the figures. Um, this thing in the middle, called the Great Pylon, was also rebuilt at the same time just to, to provide a, a terminus for the uh, uh, reflecting pool. Um, this was, oh gosh, I want to say about 1999, um, right around in there somewhere. Um, I want to point out David Newton's versions of tenor and contralto are not exact copies of the originals, and you can really get a sense of that if you look at the pictures here. This is Lawrence Tinney Stevens' tenor, and this is David Newton's tenor. And, I mean, they're close, but you can see the differences if you look carefully. One big difference is... Lawrence Tinney Stevens is, um, has his mouth open because he's supposed to be sound, and David Newton's is not making any sound because it's a fake loudspeaker. So, <laughs> um, David Newton also reproduced uh, one other lost Lawrence Tinney Stevens work, The Woofus, um, which uh, was originally created in 1936 to stand outside of livestock building number two, which is better known as the Swine Building. Um, the Woofus doesn't really need an introduction, but he may need an explanation. Uh, he was designed to represent all the principal livestock of Texas, so he has the body of a pig, the tail of a turkey, the wings of a duck, uh, the horse, I mean, the neck and mane of a horse, the head of a sheep, and chromium longhorns, because why not? Um, Stevens, uh, the sculptor, actually wrote a backstory for the Woofus. I mean, ostensibly the reason he did this was because he wanted to create a statue that looked like all the livestock of Texas, fair enough. But he apparently had a sense of humor, so he wrote uh, the story, which was um, the Woofus's mom, who he called an Australian ewe of uncertain virtue and careless habits. Um, <laughs> she, she took a vacation in Texas. Uh, she became well acquainted with our local livestock. Um, Stevens wrote, the ewe flitted lightly from a moor to a moor and from beast to beast to bird and back to beast, taking her pleasure where she found it and often too. Um, when she got pregnant, they asked her who the father was, and basically she said, everybody, and then the Woofus was born. Um, some people, you know, bring back postcards from Texas, but she did not. Um, Stevens, by the way, did not come up with the Woofus name. Woofus was a word, just a general word back then for like a what's it or a whatchamacallit. You, you know, somebody would go, what's that? And you go, oh, it's a Woofus. Um, so it was an appropriate name for the statue. So the Woofus was popular with fairgoers, but... It was one more thing that made Dallas's conservative leaders a little bit uneasy, just because they did not really know what was going on here. Um, there are stories that they thought it might be pagan. I don't know if that's true or not, but they certainly, you know, looked at it disapprovingly. Um, in 1941, uh, workers accidentally damaged the statue. It was taken down for repairs, and it was never seen again. Um, 
And actually, literally no one knows what happened to it. It's probably in a warehouse somewhere and someone will discover it and it'll freak them out and they'll think they found it. Or thousands of years from now, someone will unearth it and that'll be even better. Anyway, uh, the Friends of Fair Park started raising money for a replacement for the Wolfus in, late, uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, the new version of the Wolfus was completed in 2002. David Newton, the sculptor, used uh, Lawrence Tinney Stevens' original model to recreate this. So this is a 100% accurate recreation of the original, down to the cigarette, um, which is <laughs> not a cigarette. It's, uh, it was a fountain. It was a very sad fountain, but that's what it was supposed to be, so water would shoot out of that thing. Um, it was actually his mother who probably smoked after her trip. <laughs> anyway. Um, I could uh, keep on talking about all the restoration work that's been done at Fair Park and, and all that still needs to be done, but, but that would go on for a long time. And that's the thing about Fair Park is there's so much here, there are so many stories to tell, there's so much great history, there's so much wonderful architecture and art, it's easy to, to go on and on about it. Um, and, and the centennial stuff, which we've talked about tonight, is just the tip of the iceberg because Fair Park had been around for 50 years before 1936 and now it's been around for 82 years since then, so there's a lot of history before and a lot of history after. Um, I want to stress something in closing, though, and, and I don't want to get too preachy. I think you wouldn't be here if you didn't appreciate Fair Park, so I feel comfortable talking to you about this, but Fair Park is famous and beloved. It's, it's a city, state, and, and federal historic landmark. Restoration work has been done, like we talked about, but despite all of that, it's still a very fragile place. Um, in spite of all that, it could still go away. Um, these buildings could still fall into disrepair. We could lose more. Um, the buildings and art need upkeep. The work that's been done is, is just the beginning. You probably know if you live in Dallas, you voted for a billion dollar bond issue. Well, maybe you voted for it. Anyway, it passed uh, last fall. That includes nearly $262 million for the Parks Department, $50 million for Fair Park specifically. Uh, that's gonna help. It's gonna pay for an exterior cleaning and restoration and mechanical updates to this building. Uh, it's also going to pay for uh, much needed repairs at the Magnolia Lounge, Texas Discovery Gardens, the Music Hall, and on and on. Um, but that's not all Fair Park needs. Um, you've heard a lot about this in the news in the last few years. I don't need to go into it now, um, but you don't have a place like this that, that just coasts along. There's, there's upkeep and there's money that's needed uh, on, on a regular basis. I just wanna finish up with a couple of views of Fair Park from the past. And if you've heard these before, forgive me, but, but maybe it's good to hear them again. They're worth remembering because I think they tell us something that's been a consistent theme since 1936. Uh, the first is from Ada Louise Huxtable. She was the longtime architecture critic of the New York Times and she toured Dallas in 1976. She said, I loved Fair Park. I guess because of my basic training as an architectural historian, I've always been sort of at the cutting edge of what is currently unpopular or unnoticed. And keep in mind, in 1976, Art Deco was not popular. Um, I see Fair Park as a quite fabulous concentration of Art Deco, Art Modern buildings. I don't know how people feel about them locally, but I suspect they are somewhat underappreciated. Um, the second quote that I want to give you is from Sam Atchison of the Dallas Morning News. He was giving us his impressions of the park 35 years earlier in 1941. And at that point, just five years after the Centennial Exposition, uh, the city was proposing um, running expressways through Fair Park, like I talked about earlier. They had just finished putting out a proposal to put a freeway right in front of the Hall of State. So if you can imagine walking down the steps and being on a freeway, that's what they wanted. Uh, Atchison wrote, it is paradoxical that the most heavily patronized park in Texas is the least understood and appreciated. It appears sometimes that elected and appointed city officials suffer from the greatest lack of understanding of the nature and importance of Fair Park. And he went on to call Fair Park the single greatest asset in the park system. Um, like I said, I don't want to get preachy on you and I don't want to sound pessimistic, but um, I, I just want to say, and I think you'll agree, a lot of people still don't understand or appreciate Fair Park. It's, it's a hard place to get your head around because it's so many different things and it's so many different things to so many different people. But I just want to ask you, don't let your officials fail to grasp Fair Park's importance and its potential. Um, some of it's been lost, a lot of it's still here, but what is here is important. Whatever way you come at it, um, keep loving it and keep supporting it and keep making sure that, that your leaders do the right thing. And hopefully, 50 years from now, 80 years from now, somebody else will be here talking about <laughs> all the restoration work that's been done. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir, I think you have a question. When I was growing up, we had the ice arena and the ice space, which went on for decades. Yeah. And we had the Devil's Bowl, and uh, you know, the ice space were pretty famous. 
the Oh, yeah. He was talking about the, um, the ice capades in the ice arena, and that was a really big deal uh, back in the 40s and 50s. Um, and that's, that's part of the thing is, you know, apart from the Centennial Exposition, so many things have come and gone out here, and, and so many things, you think about the number of people who come to the State Fair every year and the number of people who have their memories from different generations, that's part of what makes it such a special place. Everybody's got nostalgia and everybody's got their own take on it, and it's special to everybody for a different reason. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, there used to be, a, where you showed that swimming pool before, there used to be a building there. The building's still there, but it had a swimming pool on top, and we used to go swimming out there back in the 40s and 50s. Oh, a pool on top of a building. Huh. Yeah. I don't know about that one, but I have to look that one up. Yes, ma'am. Well, first, let me thank you for your advocacy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Two thousand nine. Okay. It's two thousand nine. Can you go over for me? I'd always understood Margot Jones and her work was in the Magnolia Lounge starting in fifty seven. Right. So can you make the connection between the globe and specifically the the Magnolia Lounge? Yeah, sure, and that's a great question. She was asking about, well, I don't, can everybody hear what, what she was asking? I don't know how the acoustics are out there, but she was talking about the connection between the Globe Theater and when Margot Jones Theater was in the Magnolia Lounge, which it was for many years. So the story of the Globe is this. Um, after the Pan American Exposition, they were gonna knock it down, and the school system actually wanted to buy it and use it, oddly, as a place for high school students to put on Shakespeare plays, which seems like a really specific use for a building. But anyway, um, they tried to raise the money, and I don't think they did. And then Dallas Theater, Inc., which was Margot Jones's thing, stepped in and said, well, we'll buy it and we'll save it because it's a beloved building. So they got it maybe in... I don't know, like 1940, somewhere around there. And they were in the Globe until they moved to the Magnolia Lounge. Part of it was, you know, they decided that the, that the Globe just wasn't like a suitable place for what they wanted to do. And they wanted to be in a more modern building because they wanted to look more modern. And the Magnolia was certainly more modern than the Shakespearean Globe. So that was it. It was their, it was their home before the Magnolia. And then they were in the Magnolia for a long, a long time. The Globe? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Do you have any idea? No. Nope. Um, I, I don't know how many it seated. I would, I would guess it was, I mean, it had to be several hundred, but it was supposed to be, and I don't know if this is true, it was supposed to be a faithful reproduction of the actual globe. So um, I, don't know how it, I don't know how it was sized. It looks like it was fairly big. It looks big. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Sure. I'm happy to answer any other questions or make something up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I've always wondered about under the L for loss. Yeah. Oh, the dome? the dome? Yeah. I've, this one right here. Somewhere along the way, and I've, I've got to be very wrong about this, but the arch that was down at, uh, what was it, Maine and Akron? Yeah. It was taken down, was moved out to the fair, but I thought it was taken out somewhere north of, you know, the other end down there. But where, where was the arch? Do you know? I know the arch. I mean, I've seen pictures of it, but and then the, the Elks Arch? Where was it at Fair Park? Do you know? I, I, I read about this, and I, I, don't, want to, I don't know for sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where it was. Well, I know it was here, but I don't know where it was. Um, the building that you're talking about, that dome building, was called the Fine Arts Building, and uh, it was one you know, that, that they used during the centennial, and they just kind of hid it behind another building. <laughs> yeah. You can see it from this angle, but... Well, it wasn't maintenance during the exposition. It might have been later, um, but it was, it was used to display. Now, they had the art museum, but it was used for other artistic exhibits during the exposition. Um, it was a pretty building, and I, I think it lasted a, a good while, too. I think, I want to say it was torn down maybe in the 50s, um, but it, it was there for a, for a good while. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Was that part of the building materials, the, the, the structural supports? What do you <clears throat> so, so that's a good question. Um, 
what were the what made a building temporary? Um, it was the materials, really. Um, temporary buildings were often built out of wood. I mean, or at least with a wood frame. Um, some of them were made out of like the 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 clay tile, you know, that you used to see in buildings. Um, but permanent buildings like the Hall of State would be built with a steel frame, and they would be built with you know full construction and all that. But the yeah, like the stuff on the Midway was like wood and chicken wire and plaster. So that was the difference. Now, buildings like the Ford Building, um, it was partially steel and partially wood. Um, so part of it theoretically could have lasted, but it was just never meant to. They, they planned all along. So, And, and that's the thing, um, you know, talking about the, the federal building or the tower building next door, it's built with substantial materials, but they never expected it to last as long as it has. So that building is one that's needed a lot of repair over the years just because it's not supposed to still be there. I'm glad that it is, but, but for the same reason, they didn't build it thinking that far ahead. Well, the first picture you showed at the beginning showed, is that a horse racetrack? Oh, yeah. There, there was, there was, a, there was a, it was uh, a horse racetrack and a car racetrack, and sometimes there was gambling and sometimes there wasn't. It depended on if it was legal or not at the time. Um, but that, uh, the, that track moved around some and um, where it, you, you were right, where it was in that engraving is basically where the Cotton Bowl is now, more or less. But it had kind of moved to the back of the fairgrounds later and there was a thing during the exposition called the Cavalcade of Texas, which was this giant pageant of Texas history. And that was on the more recent version of the racetrack, which is back like behind the livestock barns these days. Um, I mean, there's no trace of it anymore, but. During the war, didn't they have um, airfield? Uh, did they have an airfield? They had Camp Dick out here. Oh, Camp Dick, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And it was always, you know, that's another thing about Fair Park. It was always used for a lot of different things <laughs> because here was 200 acres of city park with buildings on it, so anything that came up that they needed to use, they would use, you know. Sir. Oh, did you really? Oh, yeah. It used to be like, we used to call them the old Gulabra races. <laughs> and where were they? We go to the Devil's Bowl out there at uh, Luke 12, yeah. close out to White Rock. Mm -hmm. We'd watch the uh, races out there and on Friday nights. We'd come here on Saturday nights. Where were they here? They were within that area where the horse races were. Okay, back at the back, kind of? Yeah, it was back over there. They used to have an area called the Coliseum. And mm -hmm. <laughs> Sir? How many air conditioned buildings were there in 1936? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the exact number. There were a good bit, and um, most of the big exhibit buildings were air conditioned in 36. They made a big deal about how this was the first air conditioned fair, and it, it was the first partially air conditioned fair. They ha so that's another thing that's really horrifying to think about. There were three classes of, of buildings there. There were fully air conditioned, there were air cooled, and then there were non air conditioned. So, air conditioned was what we're used to. Air cooled, they had big fans, like giant attic fans essentially, and the idea was you'd keep the air moving, and they said that it would make it 10 degrees cooler inside than it was outside. The temperature got up to uh, 110 that summer, so it was 100 inside, so that was really pleasant. But <laughs> they, they actually published. Um, Brochures and maps that, that had like routes outlined where it was like, you know, go in this building and then it's only 50 feet to the next air conditioned building and 100 feet to the next air conditioned. I mean, it was a serious thing. The, in the, some of the exhibit halls, the, the Chrysler exhibit is one that comes to mind. They found that people were just coming and hanging out because of the air conditioning. And so Chrysler uh, started hosting bridge tournaments because ladies were coming and playing cards during the day. So they said, well, why not? Um, but you know, it was it was. If you didn't go to the movies, it was one of the few places you could go to hang out in the air. So, when I was a kid in the fifties, there were a number of uh, these concrete blocks that were drinking fountains. Yeah. And they fell into disrepair. And in recent years, some of them have been restored yeah. and replumbed. Do those date to 1936? Yeah, they do. Those those fountains are the they're the the kind of massive ones that are like rounded on the ends, right. sort of. Yeah, they are. Um, they were part of the part of the 36 fixtures, and there are a couple that are still original, and then some that have been re redone. But yep, that's part of it. I want to say something else too. Whenever the automobile building, I believe about 1948, became the automobile 
the wheel building. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was such a radical design, the Vance hit them all the big three, they wouldn't let him put their cars in there. <laughs> so he had to put his cars on the outside, the side of the automobile building. Huh. But he truly had a, a much advanced automobile over what the present, the present day design for them. I didn't know that Tucker had shown here. Do you all, do you all know about the Tucker car? Right. It's. Go home and read about it if you haven't, or, or watch the movie. The movie with Jeff Bridges is really good, but it's, it's a cool story. And he was another one that made them nervous, made everybody nervous, and they didn't let him produce his car because the, uh, the big automakers didn't want a car with disc brakes and, and padding that would keep you from killing yourself and yeah, stuff. Yeah. He really did. Sir? Did, wasn't there a presidential appearance at the Centennial? Oh, yeah, FDR was at the Centennial. Um, well, FDR and John Garner, the vice president, uh, who was from Texas. But um, FDR came, uh, he did a visit a, kind of a centennial visit to Texas, and he went to a bunch of different cities. But um, my favorite FDR at the centennial story is he gave a speech at the Cotton Bowl, like in the middle of the day. Um, it was, you know, a million degrees outside. They had gotten, like, every Boy Scout in Dallas to, to come out and greet him. So there were the millions of Boy Scouts on the field, and they had volunteers whose job it was to pick the Boy Scouts up when they would faint and carry them off the, <laughs> carry them off the field. I mean, it's just horrible. But also funny. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's newsreel footage of, of FDR speaking, and he, one of, it, part of that speech was, he said, you know, something like, I'm, I'm happy to, to congratulate Texas on its 100th birthday. You are 100 years young. And then he kind of went, hmm, <laughs> like, I like the sound of that. <laughs> but he may have been the first person to say it. Who knows? <laughs> Yes. Is it true? Was, did he, was he here for, was that uh, statue <laughs> yeah. the same year? That was, uh, FDR technically dedicated the Robert E. Lee statue. He, he wasn't super excited about that, so they kind of drove him past it, and he went, I dedicate that. Um, but yeah, he did. <laughs> he, yeah, he <laughs> threw some champagne. Yeah, exactly. The, can I tell you my favorite FDR story that doesn't relate to Dallas, but it relates to that trip? He went to, he went to Austin to... Um, this is so inappropriate, and it's going to end up on film. They were, they were just getting ready to build the um, Texas Memorial Museum on the UT campus, and so they wanted FDR to do the groundbreaking. So he was going to come in by train, and he was going to go over and do the groundbreaking, but his train was late, so they arranged this thing where he could like, stay on the train, make a little speech from the back of the train, push a button, and it would set off some dynamite that would be the groundbreaking. So his speech was like, you know, Thank you, Austin, for coming out to see me. I have something in my pants that's going to get you all very excited. <laughs> because he had this button in his pocket. I'm like, no, FDR, that's... Anyway. <laughs> and when I, when I looked that up, I read that, and I was like, wait, is that really what he said? But that is really what he said. <laughs> Sir, did you have another? I remember the ice arena. We'd, we'd go out there every Saturday and, and go ice skating. It was really popular back then. Oh, yeah. I think the ice skating was a big deal. A lot of people, hundreds of people. You know. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I may be wrong about this, but I believe that that indoor ice rink was operating at least during part of the, part of the centennial as well. So I, I think that dated back uh, as far as that. There used to also be a, a large roller skating rink down here. Oh, yeah. And the, the roller skating rink uh, was actually in the old automobile building before it burned down, and then after that they moved it. They moved it to one of the other buildings. But yeah, that was a big deal. I would too. say too. I don't know if anyone interested is drawn to the time capsules that used to be out here. Oh yeah. There were a lot of them, and I, my interest was drawn in about 1950 to one as a kid. I watched them very young. Uh huh. And Oh, really? I thought maybe I'm the only person who remembered that capsule, and he said, no, he did too. And oh, yeah. He was the only person that remembered <laughs> And we finally, through the Mayor Park group and some of them, we finally found out that they said it was out here now between what they call the Russian Bear and uh -huh. the Tower Building. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I think the plaque went away. Oh, so nobody knows where it is? Come, uh, to talk about the time capsules out here, apparently in the history of time capsules out here, 
which she researched and really got a lot of info on. They used to they used to let families bury family capsules out here and put things in them. And I don't know wow. the time frame they were supposed to be in or whatever, but there were a number of them out here. Huh. And through landscaping and building changing and all that, landscapers apparently didn't really care that much about them. And many of them got taken and thrown away. And there's probably some out here somewhere still. How about that? But that was a, a thing. We just continued to research it, and I, hope, I didn't remember if it was a 50-year or 100-year capsule. And I thought, well, if it's a 50, I'll live long enough to see it come up, you know, during all that. Yeah. But then I finally did go through her research and talking with other people that it is a 100-year capsule. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, time capsules. I, I, as a child, I watched them put all the things in it, you know, and talk about it. And yeah. I just remember the people. Do you? It was, uh, time capsules used to be a big thing. It's, I, I don't know when those kind of fell out of favor, but I mean, they used to make a big deal out of them. So it's. I think, I'm not mistaken, there was also a couple of burials out here. Oh, like peop burials of people? Hmm. Well, un under the corny dog stand. <laughs> I've uh, been privileged to work in this building during the fair for the last seven years. And as best I can remember, without fail, every year there's at least one person that comes up to me and has to tell me that they were here in 1936. Oh, yeah. An infant or a toddler. Yeah. They want to tell stories, and I love to hear the stories. Have you uh, interviewed any of these people? You know, um, I, I've talked to a few of them just here and there, and I have heard, you know, I've heard some really good stories. It's getting to where there aren't that many people who were old enough to remember it and who are still with us. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've heard, you know, most of it was just like, Oh, I was a little kid and I came and I remember it was really fantastic. But that's a nice story, too. My grandmother uh, actually was here. She was in college in Denton at the time and she came down and I asked her what it was like and she said it was expensive. Um, so that was all I got out of her. She was tight lipped. My mother did be 102 and we were out here that fall. She came every year. And so I asked somebody if they wanted to interview my mom at 102. And they said, oh, no, we just interviewed a lady that was 104. Oh, man. <laughs> she always has to show off, you know, those 104-year-olds. Yes, ma'am. Well, you mentioned the Gene Autry movie. Yes. was filmed. And, of course, I've never had anybody ever even know about that. But my great uncle was actually an extra in that movie. No kidding. One of the reasons he was selected is because he had a scar from a cow steer horn, because he was a farmer, that across his stomach and had a scar, and it looked cool on film, so. You know, people, people come to fame in different ways, so whatever. <laughs> That's cool, though. It's, you, you can actually watch that movie on YouTube now, I believe. I think you can see the whole thing for free, so if, you, if you're ever in the mood to see a Gino. I mean, there's only a part of it at, at, uh, at the Centennial, and the movie is actually about Gene Autry making a movie. So it's kind of an interesting movie, because it's, it's a movie about them making a Western anyway. What's it called again? It's called The Big Show. There's also, <laughs> there's another movie uh, out there that, that is a little bit harder to find, and it has a title that I can't remember, but it was actually part of a promotional movie that Fort Worth put out, because you know Fort Worth had its own Centennial at the same time Dallas did. So Fort Worth put out this really over-the-top hokey newsreel about how Fort Worth was going to put on its own centennial. And if you ever want to see a bunch of Fort Worth leaders talk like Foghorn Leghorn, that's the movie to watch. Because <laughs> it's, it's like all these guys going, I say, I say, Dallas ain't going to one-up us. But anyway, it's fun. Eamon Carter didn't want to be outside. Yeah, yeah. A Eamon Carter is one of the ones who like pounds on his desk and says, I'm not going to let those guys in Dallas, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. There's a lot of entertainment from back then. Um, I, oh, yes, sir. Just uh, two points, two questions. One of them is, when did they start taking like the tower building or the federal building and that became the electric building? Yeah. And like the, uh, the religion building, I remember saying gas on it. Yeah. And, the, and then the women's building. So they were all like, the electric had the electric exhibits and the gas had the gas exhibits. And yeah. The women's had that's very sexist. Oh man, the bomb shelter under the museum. That's cool. Um, the, 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 the buildings being like the electric building and the gas building, I mean, that's a state fair thing. So that, 
that kind of kicked in when it reverted back to the state fair. So as early as 36, I mean 38, I should say, you know, Lone Star Gas started using the religion building for itself. And then I don't know when the electric exhibits moved it, but yeah, that. They, they put electric on the tower of the federal building and they put a clock up on top of it too. But yeah, I mean, and that was, that's just a state. I mean, all the buildings out here have changed names so many times for that reason. The bomb shelter is underneath, um, I don't even know what that building is called now. It was, Isn't it WRR? Yeah, the WRR building that's, that's kind of back on the, on the back side of the Cotton Bowl. Science, this, yeah, the Science Place Annex or something. Science Place 2. It's the building that sort of has a semicircular portico on it, but it's like, um, you know, you've read about the, the congressional bunker that was under the Greenbrier in West Virginia. This was the Dallas version of that. So if there was a nuclear bomb headed for Dallas, city council would have hustled out to Fair Park and all gone in this bunker and they could have run the city from out here. And I guess it was supplied with like fried things and I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I have, I've actually been in there and it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's pretty... Yeah, it's still there and it's pretty disgusting, but it's really interesting. But I mean, they've got, you know, they have like a little city council room and they have little offices and a lot of old furniture is down there. And it'd be a great tourist attraction if anybody ever fixed it up. And what's above it? What's above it is... What's above it with all the vents and all where it comes up. Oh, I don't know. The playground. Oh, the playground. Oh. The playground. Well, that is, vents are good to play on. So, yeah, that makes sense. I think... Uh huh. City of Dallas owned it. And we were brought down here, and it was, it was, we were all coming down here to, we would perform operations from there if uh, that happened. Oh, so you, you did like. We was down in there, and they did show us around. Mm -hmm. And it would be that the mayor and many others would go there too. Yeah. And that had a complete console set up down in there where the police department and various other departments would also be communicated with from down there. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating so to think that. that Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like going into a, a damp basement now that with all the pleasant things that that entails. But anyway, maybe, maybe someday you'll get the chance to go down in there. Um, I, listen, I'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one, uh, out in the lobby. I don't want to keep you any longer, but I sure appreciate the comments and the questions, and I appreciate your attention. And thank you so much for coming out to hear me. Um, like Dealey said, there are, unfortunately, I don't have both books. I have Fair Park Deco out there. So if you'd like to take a look through it, you're welcome to. If you'd like to take one home, I would love to give you one or sell you one. Um, but, but thank you again. I really do appreciate your time.